Thank you so much, Shana. It's great being here with you all at Verge. I'm Gloria Walton, CEO and President of the Solutions Project. We invest in and amplify the solutions from communities at the front lines of the climate crisis. Today, I'm excited to share virtual time with one of the Solutions Project's grantee partners from the Navajo Nation, my comrade and sister, Suzanne Singer, co-founder and CEO of Native Renewables. But before Suzanne and I jump into a dialogue, I wanna ask that you carry a few key points with you today. First, if you care about climate, racial justice and gender justice, this moment is requiring us to disrupt status quo investments and partnerships. Why? Because less than 3% of private capital and less than 10% of philanthropy goes to leadership of color and a fraction of those percentages to women of color. We all can do our part to change that. And second, the climate crisis illuminates the myriad of intersectional problems we're facing. Frontline communities, and the women that are often the backbone of these communities are already innovating the multidimensional solutions that we need. Imagine what's possible when we join forces and scale our investments for frontline communities to win. And last, when you've been innovating multidimensional, multi-benefit solutions for decades, you've earned the title of expert. So let's disrupt the status quo image of who and what we tend to think experts look like and see the experts that are right before us within frontline communities, technologists and innovators that are leading transformative change yesterday, right now, and tomorrow. So please join the Solutions Project in centering frontline communities at the forefront of intersectional climate solutions. All right, Suzanne, so good to see you. Yeah, How it's are great you to see you. Today? I feel good. I'm excited. <laughs> well, speaking of experts, you're definitely an expert who inspires me. And in the spirit of providing a glimpse into who you are, uh, will you please share a little bit about your story of becoming an engineer and co-founder of Native Renewables? Yeah, well, morning, everybody. Uh, so I am a member of the Navajo Nation. Uh, I grew up in northern Arizona and... I was fortunate to have parents who were scientists and engineers, and I would say even my older relatives, my grandparents who built structures, were, I would call them engineers as well, even without having the formal education. So I think having that background and that really interest in um, you know, wanting to learn more is really instilled in what it is that I do today. So I appreciate you know, all the, the learning and the teachings that I got growing up as well. Um, the other, I think, interesting thing that I didn't realize was unique to my community was growing up with grandparents who didn't have access to electricity or running water. Um, and I think that was something I learned later uh, in life that that was a big, huge issue. You know, I just assumed everyone had knew what it was like to be in an off-grid environment. Everyone had grandparents that lived that way. Um, but, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm learning for sure that this is an issue within Indigenous communities, roughly within Navajo and Hopi is tens of thousands of families. The last I heard was 15,000 um, that still do not have access to off-grid power or do not have access to grid tide power. Um, and so in, you know, as I'm going through my career, I spent time um, in mechanical engineering. Uh, I got my PhD. I went to work at the national labs. I was very much on this research academic pathway and a chance encounter with Wahela Johns, who's the other co-founder of Native Renewables at an energy conference will kind of set the pace or set you know, the tone for thinking about Native Renewables. And we spent time talking about our frustrations and quite common, it came back to electricity. Like, why is this still a problem? And, you know, thanks to her, we actually, she was like, hey, let's start an organization. Let's start figuring this out. Um, so that was in 2016. Um, and that was amazing. We spent, you know, a lot of time learning and growing. Um, we've grown a lot in this past year. Native Renewables is a nonprofit organization as of last year, and it's been exciting. We have moved our operations to Arizona. Um, we are working on providing off-grid solar for families who don't have that access. 
Um, we're working on trying to make it affordable for those families as well, because having battery storage can be quite expensive. But the other pieces I think that were make us unique that we're bringing into our whole organization is trying to invest in our own community and people through training installers, workforce training, um, to having our teams deploy systems in the field, trying to train local people to do maintenance because there's not a lot of um, people who are able to do that for the large number of families that need that support. Um, but also trying to keep in mind our cultural knowledge, teachings and values and very much education is a huge part of what it is that we're doing to make our company or organization sustainable. Um, so I think some other things in the future that we're excited about is trying to also work within the food, energy, water systems and you know, and hopefully COVID doesn't last much longer, but, you know, I think that is also trying to make donations and help with the um, response of that effort is, is something that we're definitely passionate about. Thank you so much, Suzanne. So much of what you said has resonance with me, you know, starting with growing up and kind of assuming that your experience is everyone's experience, right? And, and then we get older and, and begin to learn otherwise. Um, and I'm just really inspired, and I'm sure everyone on this call is inspired by the vision that you and Wahela have um, for your communities. And just thinking about status quo, um, how would you say status quo practices from industry, government, and philanthropy are missing the mark? And conversely, where do you see the disruption of the status quo accelerating the transition to a clean economy that improves the lives of people in the Navajo Nation? Yeah, I think there's several things we could talk about. Um, I think one, one for sure, and you're well aware of this because you support this effort, but the philanthropy effort in starting to invest in community is on the front lines, on the ground, community-based. Um, so I see there's a lot of value in that because we are the people that know the environments we work in. Like we know the people and the communities. Um, in our case, we know the language and sometimes we, some families don't speak English. Um, so I am so excited that you and others are starting to have those conversations and invest in that. Um, I think some of the things that are really unknown in lots of um, industry government is how many families are still in need of infrastructure. Um, so not only power, but like having roads, thinking, we're thinking about the transportation sector in terms of climate, um, thinking about having access to clean water um, and even just running water. So, you know, I feel like for a lot of families, these are essential things that exist and you maybe not think about, but these are, you know, these take a lot of time and investment for families who don't have access to these things to get. And it's a lot of effort. Um, some other things that have happened recently is, um, I think, trying to share what do we think is important for industry um, when they're working in native communities. Um, I think one major thing is, you know, we're advocating for, for example, in the solar industry, companies to start thinking about hiring some of the workers that maybe they maybe thought were part time or temporary and starting to invest in their careers as well. Um, but also thinking more about, in, you know, creatively about what incentives do the communities want, except for just the project? What are some things that'll support them? Um, I think the other things that maybe some industry does industries don't understand is that culture is really important. Um, so being able to respect the culture, um, nations are, you know, federally recognized tribal nations are sovereign entities. So they have their own processes and structures and governments, and they take the time they need to vet projects from different people. And I mean, right now, I think with this, we're excited about what's happening right now in terms of funding and opportunities, but also communities are getting bombarded with requests. And I think not always out of respect and wanting to help the community. And so I think along that thread, I'll just add one more thing. I think having people, whoever's working with communities, like just do your homework, you know, know where the community is. Um, we've definitely had people come to us saying they knew the solution for us, but had no idea where Navajo was. So it's quite frustrating when you get those kind of um, people coming to the table and they haven't done the minimal amount of work. Oh, we have so much to learn from you. Um, 
in the spirit of learning, and you kind of started us in that direction uh, about advisement, uh, particularly to industry leaders, are there any additional thoughts you'd like to share, um, advice you'd like to give to industry leaders, which you've started, um, but also government officials and philanthropists wanting to support climate solutions and innovations in your community? Yeah, so I think some things that are also really exciting. So I mentioned Wahela earlier. She is now the director of the Office of Indian Energy at the Department of Energy. So, you know, loss for us, big gain for them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that's been amazing. Um, someone who's rooted in the community, you know, I think she's different than a lot of people who have been in that position before are. And I'm so excited she's there. Um, but also, I, I, God, I would love that if they had a larger, a much larger budget within that division. Um, I think one, just because they're supporting over 570 tribal nations with a small office. Um, some, I think some interesting uh, overlaps that came out of that is came from my mentors. Uh, just to give you an example. So Sandra Begay is one of my I don't know, my one of my role models. She's amazing. Um, she worked at Lawrence Livermore. I'm sorry. She well, she did work at Lawrence Livermore, but now she works at Sandia National Labs. Um, she's for many years led an internship program for indigenous students to learn about energy, tribal energy specifically. And I say she's like, I'll say she's the mom of lots of really amazing people. Her, her children have gone on to do really amazing things. Um, and that program is housed under the Office of Indian Energy. Um, I think also just incorporating or listening to the advice of other Native women. Like we have Deb Tiwa, who is our workforce manager, and she's been in this industry for over 30 years. So you know, sometimes, unfortunately, it takes her time to command the respect she deserves, but, you know, eventually she gets there and she can, you know, she leads a lot of our efforts and we're so happy to have her. Um, I think thinking about workforce programs, um, I think one of the, th the things that we've done, which I wish more and more organizations were able to do is host workshops in our communities. Like a lot of times people have to go out to border towns, they have to pay for their travel, they have to pay for registration. And we're trying to change that. We're trying to pay for travel for folks. We're trying to host it in the indigenous communities. And obviously that's hard with COVID because now we have to go virtual, but you know, I think thinking more about how you bring that, those expertise inside and not take it outside the community. Um, and then I guess just real quick, lastly, some really great partnerships that we have had are people who are willing to, you know, discuss with us, make changes based on our recommendation, um, respect our timelines, um, respect how small our team is, but, you know, ideally, um, sometimes I, I feel really terrible, but it takes us weeks to get back to people. So I apologize, but I think, you know, <laughs> having that, um, understanding that we're, we're really strapped. We get a lot of requests um, and our partners that are great understand that and they're willing to work with us. They respect the culture, they respect the timelines and uh, we love that so much, trying to make our lives easier. Suzanne, thank you so much for just investing time today, given being strapped, because um, I know how it is when you're doing work on the ground and just sharing insights and advice um, for our industry leaders, for government and philanthropy. And I'm really proud to know you. And I was just thinking about um, Hurricane Ida and recently striking the Gulf South and how our grantee partners who live and organize in those impacted areas knew that the grid would be down for weeks and asked us um, at the Solutions Project to help purchase affordable renewable energy and in particular solar generators. And, you know, of course we're committed to doing our part and helping, but we didn't know where to purchase those solar generators. So Suzanne, who did we call? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we called Suzanne because that's the expert that we know. Um, and she, you directed us to a company to make those purchases so that we can bring power back to some of those families. And conversing with you it has me thinking about other grantee partners that you've recently engaged with, like Reverend Leo Woodbury, um, who found a technology hydro panels uh, that create clean drinking water to his community in South Carolina. And you were just with Shamika Nichols, um, where you all shared a panel, I think what last week or the week prior at New York Climate Week. 
And so you recall that she spoke about the community and partner principles that inform the installation of solar powered street lights in her community in Michigan. So the work that you all are doing and in innovating not only deserves the limelight, but deserves scaled investments. And so in case you're not aware, Suzanne, your advice and expertise has guided us at the Solutions Project and our technology support of frontline innovators and organizers across the country. So thank you for setting new standards for what's possible. And I hope everyone watching will join the Solutions Project in centering the technology solutions of frontline communities all across the country. And thank you all for joining in on this conversation today and please enjoy the rest of the convening. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Peace. Thank you. <laughs>